This is a Pod Dealers Network podcast. What is TWS podcast uh, episode whatever? Who cares at this point? The rants of the vindicated. It's my podcast. I do what I want to. People, listen. Word, is it still alive? It's not working for me, Rich. We're going to keep going. I know I changed my voice at work. Bars on the radio. What is TWS podcast? When you ready? I feel like the end is staring at my watch and I'm feeling so new school. Suicide attempts. How many tries to take? Damn, 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 They ain't never going to be ready. Never going to be ready. I ain't never ready. I'm scrambling every every fucking week. Anyway, uh huh. Welcome to the What Is TWS podcast. As always, I am your boy J. Flam, representing the White Pants Society, and I must thank you first and foremost for taking whatever time out of your week to come chill with me, talk about whatever it is we talk about here. Um, nonsense, my daughter, whatever. I don't know. You could be anywhere else in the world, but you're here with me, and I do greatly appreciate that. I really do. Um, man, I'm realizing something that uh, I I was looking at my so, all right, I, I'm i doing these dating apps, right? Um, I mess around with it. And mostly, like, as a confidence builder. So, I, I'm I'm horrible. It, it's, it's horrible. I know what I'm doing is wrong, but I'm doing it anyway. Like, I need to do it. It's just, I need it. Um, so, I just, I, I put, like, my profile out on these different dating apps. And I'm really just collecting likes. Like, I'm not, you know, super concerned about matching um, and I'm probably not going to engage you in a conversation if we do match, um, just cause I don't, I don't know. I'm not there. Like I don't, I have no idea what to even talk about or say. I don't have no opening lines and I never was that type of dude. Like every relationship I've been in has been like a friend of a friend, like our introduction and our, like the icebreaker moments were all all happened organically within the context of other relationships and it was like I just walked up to some woman I didn't know and tried to build a relationship from scratch like I don't know I have no experience with that and I don't know if I have any interest in doing so but there is a part of me that like wants to know that if I ever if I ever decided to venture out of this realm of solitude that uh there would be options available to me. I, I just, I just need to, I need to know that. So anyway, I do this one app, and I like, I like the concept of the app. I do Hinge. If anybody else is out there uh, on Hinge, um, that's probably my favorite because you get to put, you know, a bunch of different things up there, pictures, like they got like icebreaker questions, and you put your answer to them or whatever. It's just you get to put a bunch of stuff up there, and then when people choose to like you. Or like your profile, they like a specific thing. So they like this picture or they like that quote or that response. So that, you know, they, they like something specific. So you kind of have some idea what it is, you know, they see in you or what it is they're attracted to about you or what it is you may have in common. Something you, you, you have some other, some basis other than, I don't know, maybe they saw my picture and they liked me or maybe they read the thing. Who knows? Um, so I like that. But what I realized is that like I got I got photos um cuz I don't take a lot of pictures of myself. I don't like taking pictures. I don't like being seen. I'm not a it's not me. It doesn't fit who uh who I was like brought up to be. I just I don't like it. I'm uncomfortable with it. And so uh you know, scrambling to find like pictures of me that don't have my ex-wife in them <laughs> cuz I didn't think that was appropriate for a date night. Um, but yeah, some of them are, are kind of old and, uh, and a lot of them are pictures that would be taken, uh, during races. So when I was heavy into the running, doing the, the you know, the 10 Ks and the half marathons and all that kind of stuff, you know, they take pictures of you while you're running and then you can pay to get, you know, certain pictures at the end of the thing. So a lot of the pictures I have that are of me, just me, um, really are, you know, pictures of me running. And I haven't run since, uh, you know, right after my daughter was born. Like, my daughter was born in 2015. We bought a running stroller and everything. Um, but that was pretty much the end of my running career. And so, uh, I'll, I see these, I'll get a notification 
that you know somebody's liked me on Hinge, and it's always uh, an exciting day for me. Um, and so I go and I go check out. You know, I wonder who this is. Let me let me say it's always in my mind that there's a possibility that I'm going to click on the app and I'm going to see the person that you know liked whatever it is they liked on my profile. And I'm gonna be so intrigued. This is going to be the one that inspires me to actually have the conversation and, and get outside of the just trolling for likes kind of thing. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I click on it. And lately, um, more often than not, uh, the like has been a picture of me like mid race. Um, and I'm like, shit, I, I got to take like, and that's immediately like, Oh, well, whatever I thought, uh, may come out of this. Uh, now nah, let me scratch that. Cause I'm not that, but like, she's, Whatever it is you like, that person don't exist no more. So I'm so sorry, <laughs> but that's, you know, store's closed. We're not doing that at the moment. I need to get back. I really want to get back to doing it. Um, but another character flaw I have is I don't like it's, it's the like it's like the, the, the predisposition to addiction. I don't know how to do a little bit of anything. And when you reach the point like I reached the point and I'm not bragging, but, you know, like I reached the point where like 10 miles was nothing you know 10 12 miles like it was light work and so i haven't run in so many years i know i can't do 10 12 miles but i know me i'm not going to be satisfied with not being able to run a mile or not being able to run three miles i'm gonna push myself and i'm gonna hurt myself or something you know because i'm gonna want to try to do what i used to could do and i can't do that (laughs) and uh it's gonna go horribly wrong i know it but yeah, so that that dude in those pictures, like, he's not real. I got to take them shits down. Like, I got to take those. I don't know what I'm gonna replace them with. Uh, is that I, I maybe I I'm not sure. I want you to see me in my current condition, but <laughs> uh, I'm gonna work. I'm working on that. I'm working on that. I'm going to that podcasting convention in uh in May, Memorial Day, and I'm like I I need to be presentable by that time. Not that I'm like disgusting or anything. I just I don't know. I got issues. I got issues. But yeah, I got to take them pictures down because it's a disappointment every time. Like I click on it and I see, I wonder what it is they like. And I see a picture of me like crossing the finish line or something like, ah, fuck. All right. Well, sorry. You know, you. it's probably better that I don't communicate with you because, uh, you know, you would have thought you got catfished or something like that dude don't exist no more. I'm not. I'm not that guy. So I got to do that. Anyway, <laughs> I digress. Um, what I'm sipping. You know, the interesting thing about this, because uh, I've started doing it now where I tell you the, the tea I'm drinking and I'm trying to keep a streak going of different teas. Um, the, this originally came from the original idea for a segment like this came from back when I had a co-host. And um, and he, I guess, fancied himself a mixologist or, you know, whatever you want to call people who mix drinks. And so he was going to do a thing, you know, every episode where he was talking about what he was drinking. And, you know. Fast forward four or five years later, I don't have a co-host. I'm sober, <laughs> and um, I'm doing it about the different teas that I'm drinking. I don't, I don't know if we ever expected it to turn out this way, but fucking here we are. Uh, the one this week, I don't know. I went back and forth with whether or not I was going to try to pronounce it or if I was going to let the computer pronounce it. I feel like letting the computer pronounce it is a little immature, um, but I am kind of immature. And it's it's called uh, Cocteau. Like that's that's what the that's the pronunciation. I'm, let me let the computer. I think the computer's uh, pronunciation is better. Koto. We gonna go with Koto. I like that. Koto. I think it's uh some French writer's last name. Yeah, French writer and filmmaker. Anyway, I don't. I'm not exactly sure. I don't know the reference why they named it Koto. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's it's grapefruit, vanilla, and mint. And um, it's pretty, it's pretty freaking good. This is another August uncommon tea. Um, I bought a whole bunch of like samples the last time I re up, and this was one of the the teas I sampled. I got like a fifteen cup bag of this, and so I've tried it hot. I've have done it iced, and um, I like it both ways. Right, pause. Um, but yeah, I think this is going to be because that is that is good stuff. Cool too. Yeah. Um, if anybody gets the reference, let me know because I, I don't understand it at all. Uh, but moving right along, 
Let's go into the Chef Elise update. So, yeah, this was another one of my weeks with Chef Elise. And um, I think right now, like the the big thing or the, the context of our weekends, you know, together are her soccer games. She's still playing soccer. Um, she still sucks. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. It's, I'm just trying to be honest about my daughter. We don't, we don't like to be honest about our kids. But she's not good at all. And I don't think she's like trying to be good. I think, uh, I don't know. I, I'm happy that she's out. She's getting fresh air. She's doing something, um, physical exercise. Um, I'm, I'm mostly excited about like the social aspect. I see her around the other girls and like making friends and they seem to be a team and a tight knit group. And they, you know, they're happy to see each other and they root for each other on the sideline. Like that stuff makes me, I'm more excited about that part of her development than I am about her being a good soccer player or being a good or bad soccer player. Cause I don't think she cares. Like I don't, I don't think she cares at all about being a good soccer player. I think she likes putting on a uniform. She likes running. I don't even know if she likes running because she doesn't run very hard. Like I, I took some video uh, this week of her game, and it's it's hilarious to me. Like I I have a good time at the games because uh, it's super funny to me to watch like how animated the coach is, and you can I don't know if it's just been so many weeks of like herding cats that he is at his wits end. But like this week you could really see him like almost losing it. Like, you know, <laughs> like he's like, he's giving them instruction and they're not doing anything close to what he's saying to do. And you could see him just like, come here, come and just having like huddles and stuff in between things. And you know, he's talking to people who are not hearing anything that he's saying. They're going to go out there, see the ball, all congregate around it and just, kick at it until somebody breaks through. It's like two players that really seem to embrace the idea of what to do once they get the ball. And then if you have them on the field at the same time, sometimes they're like competing against each other. It's it's amazing to me. It's, it's amazing. It's hilarious to watch him be like so animated and to see him get frustrated. It's hilarious to me to see like parents getting upset at like the ref making bad calls or whatever. It's like, who... Who gives a fuck? They're six to seven at the oldest. There's no goalie. We're not keeping score. It's four on four. This is like, this is not, this is some kids running around kicking a ball. Cheer if they do something good and just about everything they do is good. If they touch the ball, it's good. Cheer, be happy. They get an exercise. Let them wear themselves out. Hopefully they'll go home and take a nap or something. Like everybody be happy. I, yeah, I took video this week and um like I'm just watching the video and you can just see like she's nowhere near to play. Nowhere near to play. Like the ball is on one side of the field and she's on the other. She's close enough that she's not like staring off into the distance as you don't you don't feel like she's involved, but she's not trying to be involved. Um and, but ironically this week I think she got her foot on the ball more times than any other week, which was something to cheer about, you know. She actually touched the ball a few times. They have her doing like goal kicks. I think the coach is doing stuff to get her involved. Uh, so you know, she they have her doing goal kicks, and so she's a part of the team. And I like it. I'm I'm happy. I'm happy about it. The weird thing that happened though is that um, so her game was at like an ungodly hour. Ungodly. It was a fifteen. I know that doesn't sound early to you, but you know you've worked the whole week. Yeah, I, I get her Friday afternoon. Uh, you, we, I like to try to have some activity or something for us to do Friday afternoon, you know. But when I'm getting there at you know four or five o'clock on Friday, and um, we got a game at eight fifteen, it's like you know, I got to get her something to eat, you know, have dinner, get her ready for bed. Like you got to go to sleep because we got to get up early. I had the I had to get up at like six to wake her up by seven. No, scratch that. Yeah, I got up at 6 to get her up at maybe like 6.15 to be out of the house by 7. And I, you know, I don't know. I'm so, I'm notoriously late. So, especially when it has something to do with my daughter, um, I'm not trying to be the dad that's late. So, 
Uh, I'm so scared of being late that I'm like super early. So yeah, we got there maybe like 7.30 and we were like, there was nobody else. Nobody else at the entire like sports park. Like we were the first people there at the park, period. All the fields, nobody else. I don't even think like the groundskeeping staff and stuff was there. It was, it was stupid. But anyway, but I digress. Before that, um, so I, I got her up, you know, six six fifteen in the morning. You know, she doesn't want to get up because she's probably stayed up way too late watching these dumbass uh, YouTube videos that she watches. Um, and I'm a bad dad for that. I pretty much, I pretty much tell her like, don't stay up too late, and just and just leave it at that. Like, I'm just, I'm not fighting the battle with her about going to sleep anymore. Like, it's I'm not, I'm just not. So anyway, we we get, I get her up. I get her dressed, I get her breakfast, um, and uh, and they have these little uniforms, just, you know, shorts, um, a jersey, um, you know, she's got shin guards, socks, and cleats. Her mom had all those things, so we were just going to put on the socks and, like, some Crocs or something and meet up and, and do the shin guards and cleats when we got there. Um, but then they have bows that they put in their hair that coordinate with the uniform. And uh, Elise has, like, twists, I guess, twists. Look like little mini dreads or something to me. I don't. I I don't know hairstyles. I'm not describing it appropriately, but we're gonna go with twist. And uh, you know, she's got the bow, and so she got. I let her put her clothes on, and she did a good job this week. We've had weeks where she put the shorts on backwards, and I didn't realize it until we got there, and uh, I had to take that L. But this week, you know, she got every everything was on, right side, front, whatever. Everything was on correctly. Um, but she didn't know how to put the bow in her hair because she didn't have a bun. She just had a little twist. So I gathered up some twists and I guess like made a bun and uh, put the bow in her hair. And she even, when I did it, she was like, oh, wow, dad, how'd you do that? And I'm like, man, you know, dad got skills. I got my I got my ways. Like, don't don't second guess dad again. Um, I can do this. I'm grown. And so I, I did it. And I, I felt pretty good about, you know, what I had done. So, um. We get to the game, you know, we meet up with mom. Mom puts on the cleats and the uh, and the shin guards and everything, completes the uniform. And um, and then at some point, like, she says to mom, like, uh, look look what dad did with my bow. And when she said it, like, uh, you know, I don't know, the way I took it initially was, you know, dad was able to get the bow in my hair. Um, and I was like, yeah, I did. Boom. And then there was a part of me that kind of felt like, because she said it again, like, look what dad did to my bow. And I'm like, is she, is she snitching on me? Like, is this, is this criticism? Like, I don't get it. You know, and then a little bit, a couple minutes went by and they practice, they practicing before the game. And then she comes off the field again and she mentions the bow again. And I'm just like, man, is this really feels like an indictment on how I put the bow on her head. And, and understand, women, from a man's point of view, it's a bow in her hair. There ain't can't be that many correct or incorrect ways to do it. If the bow is in her hair and is not moving and is facing the correct direction, I don't understand. I don't see how I could have possibly done it wrong. But. And she can't see the bow because it's in her hair. So I'm, I'm, I am not understanding the conversation that's being had right now. This is the, like the fourth time she's brought up this bow in her hair, um, and like, and then eventually her mom just turns to me and she's like, "I can't take it anymore. I gotta fix it." And it's like, huh, what? <laughs> I was just like, "What?" I'm like, "I, Dad is trying the best he can. What? How could I? It's a bow." In her head, like it's on there, it's on there, it's not falling off. I don't understand. And there's never any explanation that was given to me as to what was wrong with the bow and what mom did to fix the bow. I didn't see the difference when mom fixed the bow. Another mom, like, co signed it, like, he, you know, he tried, but like, how did what, how did I fit? And, and, and so I, I don't even think. Y'all understand, like, the impact this has. This is why you deal with some guys who just don't even don't even make an effort, like, don't even try. Like, just, you know, 
That's mom's job. That's mom's job. Because that is, is, it pisses you off, one, when somebody has to come behind you and correct you on something that's inconsequential. Like, it doesn't, doesn't fucking matter. The bow's in her hair. Like, they're not losing points because the bow ain't in her hair correctly, whatever that is. You know, she's six. I don't think anybody's judging her on her bow placement. They know she didn't put it in her hair. So the other little girls aren't laughing at her because the bow's not the right way. Like, it's completely inconsequential, but you feel the need to have to fix it, uh, you know, and, and indict dad. Um, and then, like I said, no explanation given as to what was wrong with the bow. So for all I know, no matter what I do with that bow, dad ain't going to do it right and it's going to have to be fixed. And dad ain't going to do that every week. So now dad is not putting the bow back in her hair ever again. That's how petty I can be. But I feel like my daughter snitched on me and she wouldn't let it go about the bow. And um, and she don't know who she's fucking with. Dad, <laughs> dad is far pettier. So later on in the, in the visit, she mentioned um, wanting a Barbie dream house or something like that and so when i went to hand her off to mom um i made sure i let you know her and her, her stepdad know that uh elise has problems cleaning her room and that um we were gonna have to work on that especially if she wanted this barbie dream house so i dropped that on everybody's so nice three versus one on this barbie dream house she gonna have to be a good little girl and listen to everybody because everybody's now in, co- in cahoots and we're going to be sharing information over what she did and didn't do and who she did and didn't listen to. And all of this is going to be factored into whether or not she gets this Barbie dream house. That's what happens when you snitch on dad for no apparent reason. I ain't tell mom we was watching SpongeBob this weekend. You know she don't like that. But I ain't snitch on you. I am now. But it's payback. Payback is what it is. That's the Chef Elise report. Um, Man. Real quick, I, I I I did have so much more to talk about, but uh, as you can tell, I, I feel some way about that bow. Uh, I went to see Dion Cole this weekend. Oh, not this weekend. It was like Thursday. It was a school night. Uh, I want to say first, he talked about in his show. It was a hilarious show, hilarious show. And uh, the fact that he just lost his mom recently and is like still out performing and has got to put on a smile and you know and go out and make people laugh and make people happy. At a time where he's he's hurting, you know, considerably, um, is amazing, and you know, and shouts to people that that do that, that um, you know, can put themselves and what they're dealing with aside to go out and do their job, you know. But you know, especially when your job involves you having to make other people happy and put on a face and be happy for other people, that's that's a tremendous amount of strength. So I, I appreciate him for that, and my condolences to him and his family. Um, he talked about in the show, you know, about like, uh, the value of time and like not wasting his time. And it was so perfect. It was so perfect because black people, we got to stop. We got to stop with the CPT, CP time. Like we got to stop with not being on time for shit and like that being cool and acceptable and just a part of, you know, who we are. The shit is fucking annoying. And this is as a person who's routinely late for stuff i'm like late for work and uh you know but i i don't know when i when i know other people are involved or something you know it, that it's going to affect somebody else which should be work but whatever um it's going to affect somebody else i try to you know try to be on time but it, it, it's extremes like so this Dion cole show um the advertised time on the ticket was 9 30 now we know the show not going to start at 9.30. Um, you know, nothing was happening at night. People was take, getting their seats at 9.30. That's understandable. I think I was in line to, you know, get a water or something, um, and some iced tea or something at, at 9.30. An opener came on around 10 o'clock. So 10 o'clock, the opener's coming on. People are still getting their seats. People are still in line to get drinks. All good. Dion Cole didn't come out till probably around 11 o'clock. So we're now at an hour and a half past the time that um, they said to be there. Now, when Dion Cole is, is on stage and doing jokes about not fucking with his time, there are people just getting there, trying to find their seats, walking it. You fucking up my show 
because you are hour and a half late for a show. You are missing the headliner. Like you paid to see this dude and you didn't even get there in time to see his entire performance. Like this it's nonsensical to me. Nonsensical at all. Now you fucking up my enjoyment because you gotta somebody's gotta keep shining the light over here and staring at the numbers on the thing because they can't figure out where you supposed to sit. You had an hour and a half to figure out where you supposed to sit. You are fucking with my time and like we gotta we gotta we gotta stop. <laughs> We got to stop. Um, another thing he mentioned in the show that I thought that like resonated with me personally um, was he was just talking about like the way he was brought up and in the context of like the way the world is now with, um, you know, uh, the LGBTQ community and, and you know, and, and the, the prevalence of that today versus the way things were for, you know, people his age and my age. I think he's... Uh, in his fifties, you know, and I just turned forty, but it was, it, it was a different, a different world. And he talked about like having uncles, like homophobic uncles, and like going places at eleven years old with his uncles, and just like having to be afraid of his mannerism, like of of having a mannerism or doing something that somebody could possibly perceive as feminine, because that would get your ass whooped, you know, and like and like having that experience growing up definitely makes it uh, somewhat difficult to adjust. And he's like, you know, as much as people want, you know, everyone to be um, accepting and patient and stuff like that, like, I want to do that. And I'm asking, you know, folks to be patient with me because this is, you know, this this is going to take a little bit of work. And I've, you know, and I've, I've said that on this show before, like, I'm trying to understand things and things are changing almost faster than I can understand them. And it is an extreme departure, you know, from everything I knew. I had, you know, I was raised by a bunch of uncles, and I think there was a, a huge concern when it came to me about, um, you know, masculinity and uh, and my manhood because my father wasn't in the house, and, you know, it was just me and my sister, and I spent a lot of time with my aunt. Um, you know, I was the people that were closest to me and that I spent the most time with were all women, and I think everybody around me was kind of concerned about um you know masculinity when it came to me i was short and uh you know underweight kind of kids i was i was already small and frail and soft spoken and, and all that kind of shit and um and yeah my, i mean my mother you know and i think it was something that they didn't know how to not everybody knew the appropriate way to kind of like promote masculinity to me um you know, my mom, and I love my mom to death, she's, and she's going to hate me for this, but I, you know, she used to be, she used, she used to get on me about, like, the way I would hold the dish rag or something. First off, if you, if you are okay with putting your hands in water with uh, food, dissolved food particles and stuff from meals that people, that other people have eaten and disposed of, and it's all just swimming in a sink with a little bit of soap. Um, I think that's an issue with you. It's not an issue with me that I find that disgusting. Like, that's something wrong with you that you are just okay with that. Right? So don't treat me a certain kind of way because I'm not. Because I think that should be the default. That that should be the default reaction to that. Like, oh, look at this water with the leftover meat chunks swimming in it. I need you to stick your hand in that. And grab these dishes so we can wash them. No, I didn't want to do that. And she would make comments, you know, you acting like a fairy and stuff like that. Like, so this is like, this is the experience that I had growing up. And, um, and like, yeah, my uncles were very much like men, men, they were manly men. And, um, and I don't think they ever, they never did the, you know, that's gay. Stop acting like that. You acting like a girl or something like that. They never did that. But there was definitely a consistent theme of, you know, be a man, be a man. And if somebody says to you, you know, be a man, um, know they're not saying that what you're doing is wrong, but you're immediately aware that whatever I'm doing right now is not manly. I need to change whatever it is I'm doing. And so, you know, yeah, like that's the experience a lot of us had as kids and around people that loved us and cared for us and that believed that what they were doing was 100% in our best interest. And I'm not sure... It wasn't. I'm just, 
Yeah, it leaves a mark on you. It leaves a mark on you that even now when I see certain behavior from people, it's, it's off-putting to me. Because uh, this was behavior I was always pushed to not exhibit or to understand that I wasn't supposed to exhibit or to be a man was to do something different than this. And so when I see, you know, that behavior sometimes, it like the immediate reaction is not always going to be, okay, great, you know. Now, yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to compare it to like how I feel about, and this, I'm going to get in so much trouble. Uh, I want to compare it to like how I feel about ketchup and pickles. Like I hate ketchup. I hate ketchup. I hate the smell of it. Same thing with pickles. I hate the smell of them. I don't, I just, I hate them. I hate them. I'm, it's, I have such an aversion to ketchup and pickles that if I'm eating and we're at the same table and you're eating and you want to, you know, douse your shit in ketchup or put pickles all over it. If there was an option for me to eat somewhere else, that's where I would, that's what I would do. Cause I don't want to be at the table with you and your ketchup and pickles. I don't like it. Like I, it's just, I have an aversion to it. I don't want to stop you from eating your ketchup and your pickles. I don't really want to make you feel a certain kind of way about eating ketchup and pickles. That's a hundred percent. You're right. I'm glad that you enjoying your food. Enjoy it. I just don't want to be around it because I don't like it. You know, and I don't think that's wrong. And so, and, you know, and so I say that to be uh, in certain situations, there's stuff that, um, that I don't like, or maybe my immediate reaction, you know, is adverse, you know, because of, you know, my, my personal experiences. I'm not trying to take anything away from anybody or I don't even want to make you uncomfortable. Um, but I am uncomfortable and I've got a, and I'm learning, trying to figure out how not to be uncomfortable, but I am uncomfortable. So understand that and, you know, and, and, and be patient and tolerant with me as I try to figure out this whole thing. I don't know. I didn't do nearly as good a job as he did because his shit was funny. And uh, when you make it a joke, uh, you know, the pill goes down. Just a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. Uh, I didn't. It didn't work that way with me. And the last thing, and um, this is just a conversation I've always wanted to like start. So this is gonna be very open ended. I don't have like a concrete opinion, or I don't know what the answer is, or what the right or wrong way to view this is. Um, I just, I just, I really want to have this conversation. So at some point, um, he was just trying out, you know, material. You know, he has that bit where he's just like, "I'm gonna try some jokes on you," and he usually pulls out pen and pad or or, or his phone or something, like trying out jokes. So one of the jokes or one of the questions was, "Is the phrase no way Jose racist? Is it is it racist to say no way Jose?" And um, and he left it, and I got a laugh, and he left it out there. And then eventually, he's like, you know, he he appealed to the Hispanic people in the crowd, and he asked him if it was okay for him to say it, if he could say, "No way, Jose." And they, you know, responded resoundingly with approval, like, "Yeah, you, you, yeah, no, no worries, like that's not what no issue." Uh, and he let that sit for a second, and then I don't know if this was always a part of the joke or whether he just saw the opportunity, saw the moment. He asked, you know. <laughs> If white people could say it, and I, you know, I guess how that went. Now you know they didn't get the pass to say it, and then and that was a whole part of the joke. Like there was like white folks in the front row, it's like you could see them, like they was excited, like they was about to get, you know, added to the group, and then they got, that they got rejected at the last second, and it's just like that, oh, uh, you know. And then at some point, while this joke, while this joke is going, people are still laughing at this joke. Somebody in the crowd yell, uh poor white people, you know, laughingly, jokingly, not seriously, but jokingly. And um I don't know. One of the I I, I mentioned the what I'm sip what I'm sipping segment earlier as like one of the things we had planned originally for this show. Another thing we wanted to do, and I still want to do, I just don't know how to do it. Um as I was talking about having like an offense matrix. And uh, the idea was it seems like there's certain groups that aren't allowed to be offended by certain things by or, or by certain people. If it's coming from a specific source, then you can't be offended by it. But if it's coming from this source, you can be offended. So I wanted to do this whole like offense matrix and try to do like a, I don't know, like the March Madness 
of who can offend who kind of thing. And um, and I was thinking this week, like, I've often wondered what it must be like for, like, white people <laughs> and, uh, and the way things go right now. It's like because of their place of privilege, you know, a lot of times they get treated like they cannot express any offense toward anything. Like, you know, because you win so often, you need to be okay with these L's you're going to take. Because you got a history of winning and winning at other people's expense. Um, you got to be okay with these L's that you got to take. And and it extends, and, like, and that concept extends to not just white people. Like I said, I, I think it's anytime you are looked at as the group in a position of privilege, then you lose that right to be offended. And I, and, and I think, you know, people typically view things from the perspective from the perspective of the demographic they belong to. So I see it a lot right now, which is why I'm kind of like all of a sudden sensitive to it for white folks. Cause I'm seeing it a lot for just men and like masculinity, like, uh, because being a man has been a position of privilege, you know, in relation to women. Um, it's like anything can be said, you know, or whatever about you right now. And you just got to take the L and, um, a lot of the L's we deserve, you know, I, every time I wake up and I see some shit, I'm just like, God damn it. Nigga. Like you couldn't like, God damn, I'm tired of, I'm tired of take L's for you motherfuckers. Like, please just stop, just stop. Just be good. Just be right for one day. Give me one week of good behavior. So I don't have to read this shit. I was, whoo, I was so upset about the, uh, Aesop Rocky stuff. And, um, it's, it's seeming like, like that wasn't, what we thought it was but that's another like clear-cut example of what i'm talking about like you know um when that story broke that him and rihanna was apparently splitting up and i don't pay attention to celebrity shit but this one hit my radar somehow but you know when that story broke you know it was the it was the usual you know the usual response about black men and you know, it's like if rihanna can't you know, if you, if you cheat on Rihanna, what chance do any of us have? And, you know, and it's, it was a lot of shit. And he, and now that it's kind of died down and there, people are backing away from that story. Ain't nobody coming out and saying, oh, my bad. You know, we was wrong about ASAP. It's like right on the heels of that, he got arrested. And so it's it's almost like, well, if he ain't a cheater, he's a murderer. So he deserved it anyway. So we're not going to, you know, whatever. You know, I don't know. Did he kill the dude or? Is it just somebody got shot? I don't know. I don't. I stopped following it because I ain't want to hear the the bullshit anymore. But it, it's like that. It's that. It's that offense matrix. It's like because as men, we've lived in a position of privilege in relation, you know, to other demographics, uh, or I guess heterosexual men, we've lived in a position of privilege in relation to other demographics. Uh, there's this idea that you know. I don't know that but we can't take offense to stuff. And you can say whatever it is you want to say about us or blame us for whatever and you know I mean an, another one would be the the Will Smith situation. You know, the, a lot of attention was paid to the joke that was made about Jada because it is what preceded the slap. Um but there wasn't a lot of conversation about the joke earlier in the night from Regina Hall. Um you know, basically making fun of their quote unquote open relationship and, 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 you know, and she was, <laughs> she was basically calling out men that she wanted to be around for lack of a better word. Um, and then it got to, you know, Will Smith and she's like, I talked to Jada and Jada already, you know, and Jada already co-signed and approved it. So get your ass up. Like, you know, it was, it was very much a joke that if the genders are reversed is not cool. Um, and it was very much a joke that was taking a shot at some of the public embarrassment that, you know, Will has had to deal with because of the openness of their relationship. Um, but everybody laughed at that. Will included, Jada included, and the night went on, you know. Um, and there was no outrage or anything about that. No outrage. You know, because I, I think it's just accept that even when people talk about like the Jada and Will situation and, and her and August, whatever his name is, um, it's like I don't know if Will's outside situations have been brought up and been as public 
and as uh as as hers were, but the conversation almost gets skewed to the way well, you know Will was doing something too, you know. Like not even we gotta know. We don't need to know if he did or not. We don't need concrete proof. He's a dude, we know he was doing it. So you gonna take this L. You're gonna take this L for all the L's that we took, you know, prior to this. I, I don't know what the correct I don't know. I don't know what the right way for it is. I don't know if it's like, you know, so I, I don't know when, when a person yelled out poor white people, I almost did feel like, damn, poor white people. Like if you're a white person in the audience, like the entire crowd is not laughing with you. <laughs> They're not laughing with you right now. They're laughing at you. And is that, is that cool? Is that okay? Patrice O'Neill talked about it once. He's like, I hate how much fun I can have racially. He's like, I can sit up here and say anything about you. And you just got to sit there and take it like, yeah, yeah, I am the devil. Like this, this, this is the actual like bit, you know, from Patrice O'Neill. But just you know, making addressing it like there is a there is a difference. There's a disparity in in what I can say and what you can say. And it's like because you are in a position of privilege, they're just like L's you're supposed to be able to take. Dave Chappelle talked about it like unrelated, but I think it it fits, you know. Like, you know, if like if you're talking about, you know, being hungry and somebody's like, man, there's people starving in Africa and you're like, yeah, true. And I still want lunch. Like, you know, like I just because somebody else hurts more or, you know, because that's perception, um, just because someone else is hurting and hurting in a way that looks uh, worse than the way I'm hurting doesn't mean I'm not hurting. Doesn't mean, you know, I'm. If I don't hurt the worst, then I'm incapable of hurting. I talk about it. I used to call it the uh, the pain Olympics, you know, because that's what we do. Like we compare our pain to somebody else's pain. And if their pain is greater then our pain is irrelevant. And um, in these situations, I think, you know, we compare our, you know, our history to someone else's history. And if our history is more oppressive than theirs, then their current trauma is irrelevant. And this is getting to be way deeper than I wanted it to be. And um, I don't know if I thought it out as much as I wanted to think it out. But I, I think I'm hitting on the points that I wanted to hit on. And I, it's just the kind, I would love to hear someone else's perspective about shit like this. Because I am definitely, I definitely feel both sides of it. As a black person, you know, sometimes, you know, I mean, I was, I was in there with the joke. I wasn't on the... I went on the other side of the joke like, y'all are wrong for laughing at shit. The shit was fucking hilarious when he asked if the white people could say it and the crowd resoundingly said no. Shit was fucking hilarious. I think the poor white people comment kind of fucked with me a little bit, but that you know that was after the fact. So I get it on that side. But then on the other side, when it's just like, I think at one point someone labeled me as a men's rights activist. And then it, like that made me, that made me a bad person. Like, if to advocate for the rights of men like i'm not advocating this is not like uh male pride or male supremacy this was just like situations where i feel like the plight of men is lost and we could we could use you know some help or someone to say hey i see what you're going through there um let's address it let's not act like you're not going through something because somebody else appears to be through something worse uh, or because, you know, you win 90% of the time, you know, you should be able to take these losses, you know, with no problem. Uh, it's like, yeah, let's, let's, let's just talk about it. Or let's just address it. But the fact that, you know, I had that kind of feeling um, like made me a bad person, you know, or as I think, you know, if, if I'm a, there are a lot of other, you could put a lot of other words in front of rights activists and it'd be good. But yeah, I think if you were to say you was a right, a white <laughs> rights activist, somebody would probably have an issue with it. Like what rights don't they have? I guess that's how you feel about men too. Like what rights don't they have? Um, and there's a few in my opinion. Uh, I don't even know that I am a male, a man, men's rights activist. I just noticed how I got labeled and it was not a good thing. <laughs> it was not a good thing. And I don't see how them three words are negative. Um, but put them together and um, it was not a good look for me. Not a good day. I lost some friends over shit like that. But 
It is what it is. It's, uh, it's just a conversation I want to have. Uh, I think I have some, you know, some people out there that have very intelligent points of views, the points of views I respect. I'd love to hear, you know, your opinion on it. And even the not so intelligent ones, uh, I welcome it as well. I could use a laugh every once in a while. <laughs> but yeah, this is going on way longer than I expected it to. Um, I do at some point want to fill out my offense matrix and maybe, or maybe just talk about like, yeah, why we feel like certain people got to take L's certain times. Like, and it's just cool. Like we, we can do that. We can talk about them however we want to talk about them for what reason? Like what's the criteria in that? Not saying it's right or wrong, but just trying to understand the rules of it. What's the criteria? What, what makes a situation excusable and what makes one not, or, you know, what makes certain trauma discussable and makes others not. First world problems. The shit that we say to like illegitimize somebody's struggle because it's not comparable to another one in whoever's eyes. You know, trauma's trauma. If you're hurting, get help for it. Don't feel like you can't get help for it because you're a man or you're white or you're whatever. You know, if you if something happens and it affects you, go get some help. Like, don't. Poor white people. I, it was funny, but it's not. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see if this is my last episode. Anyway, I don't think I went. To, I ain't go that hard. I ain't say nothing crazy, did I? Did I? Y'all are telling me. Somebody. Read. On that note, cost to action. My homie Zaya Fitness. If you're trying to get your nutrition goals and your fitness goals right, hit them up. Uh, the website is livealphafitness.com. That's L-I-V, alphafitness.com. You can get you where you want to be. Uh, and then yeah, I got merch. It's the sum of the algorithm. So officially, officially coupon code algorithm will get you twenty percent off your entire order. Uh, got a bunch of shirts out there. I'm doing the gaining definition thing. So I got my definition shirts out there. Dopeness mug. Fuck it though. Um, probably gonna be adding some more very soon. But yeah, head out there, get you some stuff. Twenty percent off with the coupon code algorithm. And um. Hoping to see, you know, a bunch of the fellow black podcasters at the Black Pod Festival in Atlanta in Memorial Day weekend. Uh, I will definitely be there. I should be there. I purchased everything. I cleared the time off. I did what I was supposed to do. I, I did some high level adulting in my in my mind. So I should be there. I've planned this fucking trip. I'm going to fucking do it. I'm doing it. And then I'm going home and I'm hanging out with uh, the Uncomfortable Truth podcast. Looking forward to that. All kinds of dope things happen. And I still have this like huge adult moment that should be coming to fruition very soon. And you can be like, the fuck did you build all this shit up for for this? But understand, it's huge to me. Objectively, this is a milestone and I'm going to celebrate it. Fuck you. Sorry. But <laughs> with that being said... Uh, until we speak again, be safe, be the light, be easy, and know this if you know nothing else, regardless of what demographic you belong to, I love you. Holla.